What's up, Ethan? Thank you so much for joining me on my show. We've been longtime internet friends. It's going to be good to, to jump into a conversation with you. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. Likewise. All right. I start my podcast with the same question every time. And in this case, I'm a little bit interested about what the answer is going to be. Uh, the background photo of your Twitter is just like <laughs> a fucking gray box. <laughs> so, so what does the background photo on your Twitter mean? <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is an abstract statement on the, <laughs> the, the purposelessness of life. Now, um, it's funny. I, so I was listening to some episodes before we jumped on here, and I heard that this is your opening question. And I was yeah. like, oh, shit, I got to like... I thought about I thought about updating this, but no, it, it I haven't changed it. It's it is it is just blank. That'll tell you something about how uh, new I am to Twitter. I'm still relatively new on the scene there. <laughs> I haven't I didn't even to be honest know you could set something there until like a couple of days ago. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it, so that's yeah that's that's my background story. But I might be able to tell you uh, something about the profile picture, yeah, which sure. I can maybe I can make up for it. So. Um, that picture is a photo that I took during a hike. I was out, out hiking with a buddy of mine in Vermont. And uh, this was winter of 2012. I had just moved back to New England um, after living in a, I was living in a box truck in Hawaii. And that's where I started writing. So I, I, I had gone to Hawaii in part because I could live there really cheap. I could finish my degree online and I could write. And I had just moved back to New England and was looking to rec really get started in writing. And this, like I said, back in 2012, the funny thing is there, there really was no super clear cut avenue to making a living as a writer, yeah. you know? Like there were a few people, I mean, I, I really loved travel writing. So I was paying attention to people in that space. Um, and there were a few people who were killing it. like. Nomadic Matt, I think it was just wrapping either his he's first or second it. book. What's that? Oh so yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's still killing it. And back then, though, you know, he was kind of like early to the influencer blogger scene. But there was just there was no way to do it, man. Or it was it was it was a grind. I'll tell you, my first um, my first writing gig was uh, I found on Craigslist. And it was reviewing dating websites for 15 bucks per review. And I took it at first and I'm like, you know, you got to start somewhere. And then as soon as I looked at these sites, I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. They were so sketchy. I'm like, if anybody reads this and believe, I just had this image in my head that somebody was going to get like locked in a, in a dungeon somewhere because <laughs> of my review. So I ultimately walked away from it. And long story short, that picture was taken right at the exact same time the difficulty of becoming a writer sent me on this very sort of circuitous route over the next 10 years through web development and then uh, community building for web development. And then now because of some of those hops ultimately stumbled my way back into being a writer in a time when there's actually demand for it, which is what brings us to this conversation today. So, yeah, well, that's perfect, man. Um, I appreciate the story. I, I say you just need to keep your background photo blank now uh, from this <laughs> point. Uh, and yeah, man, before every podcast, I do like just a little bit of research. I line up some questions and then what always happens is I kind of throw the questions out because the conversation lends itself to where it's supposed to be. And uh, on that note, I don't even try to do this. Like I consider myself a writer and I guess just by nature of the people that I'm attracted to or whatever, it seems like it's always people that are um, infatuated with, like sort of obsessed with that craft of putting words on a page. And it's hard. And I think the reason why I like writers the most is because it's the hardest thing to do. Um, mm. And I don't, I don't think it's even close, to be honest. Like video editing is difficult and there's a craft to it, but just the process of sitting down and being at battle with like your mind to say like, this is worth saying, this is what I'm actually trying to say. Like I articulated my thoughts in a concise way in like the shortest amount of words possible. Um, so I did not know that about yourself. I did not know that you were like an aspiring writer. Where did that come from? Like, have you always been into novels? Were you always into blogs? Why, why writing? I never knew that about you. Uh, 
that's a great question. So, you know, I think a, a love for writing and storytelling is probably the only thing that has been consistent throughout my entire life. Yeah, like I grew so. up, yeah? yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. And that's really what we're talking about too at the end of the day. Like all these media companies that are popping up, whether it's a newsletter or like TikTok influencers, all these different media companies that are now successful. When you really get to the bottom of it, it's storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, I, I think, I think um, humans are natural storytellers. And that's one of the reasons that so many people are moving into this creator economy is it, like, it allows you to build on something that maybe comes very naturally to us as a species that we hold like really important. Um, so yeah, for me personally, um, I won't say it's something that I've always been good at, and obviously, like, you know, every writer, I think, is always getting better. Um, but it is something that I've always been interested in. And if I think back to what started that, you know, for me, it was like adventure books, man. I love Robinson Crusoe growing up, which, which, by the way, I just learned recently is like one of the first English novels. What? Did you know that? No. Yeah, in the like in in our current format, um, don't quote me on this. Although we're, <laughs> it's just you and me, right? No one's gonna see this. Yeah, I I bought an old version of of Robinson Crusoe recently, and there's like a little forward in there that talks about Defoe, who's the guy who wrote it, and they they were they're just talking about how like revolutionary that type of writing was for its time. You know, before before that book, um, literature was just very different. It was much, and if you go back and read like the old Victorian literature, you can sense a difference. My takeaway was that Crusoe was like much more character driven. And um, it's interesting to me, I didn't realize how old it was either. That book was written hundreds of years ago. Uh, so it was a quick aside, but yeah, books like Robinson Crusoe or like Treasure Island, all those, I loved those growing up and I just wanted, I, I just remembered it. So I wanted, I wanted to have like a life of adventure. And I'll tell you, you want, you want to know what hooked me? It was this, Indiana Jones. <laughs> yes. the, <laughs> the one with Sean Connery, where he's got the grail diary. Yeah, the last crusade. Yes, yeah. I saw that movie and his notebook. And I was like, I want a notebook like that. Like I want to live the kind of life where you have like cool leather bound notebooks with sketches and notes and all, all kinds of stuff in it. And it just hooked me. I wanted to be like a travel writer for the longest time. So that's going back 25 years or so. Um, kind of my earliest memories of doing it. And then when I, when I turned like 10, I think it was, my parents bought me a leather bound notebook. It was the very first one I ever had. And they, I still have, uh, I don't have a notebook anymore, but I have the front page where they said, you know, hey, just thought you could use a place to keep track of your adventures. And I did. It, that movie and that gift changed my life, I think, in some, in some like weird way. Man, this is so cool. You and I have such similar stories. This is almost embarrassing to say, but fuck it, I'm going to say it. I carry a notebook with me everywhere. If you're watching <laughs> this on YouTube, I put it up. I got stacks and stacks of them in the other room. I keep all of them. You got your notebook? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> My mom used to read me the book, Harriet the Spy, when I was a kid. And I thought it was the coolest thing to just go around everywhere and keep track of all of the shit that I saw. And, um, and I still do it till this day. I mean, I don't even really necessarily know what these notebooks are for. There's not necessarily a point. I'm not trying to like create anything. I'm just keeping track of all of the shit that I see. And I think somehow through just the process of because it writing is two things, I think. Well, this is kind of a um, like a generalized statement, but there's the act, the difficult act of getting your mind on a page as unpolished as it is, and that's like really hard. Because even if nobody's watching, you can't lie to a notebook. You know what I mean? Like if you write something, by nature of it coming out of your mind onto a page, it's just the truth. And I think that process is difficult for people. And then there's the second step, which is. I don't know, call it what you want, the publication aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, yeah, I was just hooked on that. And I think I was very similar to you. I wasn't necessarily into the travel stuff. I was, 
just weird and shy when I was a kid. And so yeah. it was like my friend, you know, everywhere I went, I just had this buddy that I could talk to. I could say whatever I wanted to it. It never like bitched at me or fucking <laughs> grounded me. You know what I mean? I, I think it's so cool how similar those stories are. Yeah, that is really interesting. You know, you're making me think of something too now, which is like a lot of the most interesting people that I know have very similar stories and habits. Like we have a guy here at The Hustle, uh, Zach, who writes our Sunday story. And he's one of the most interesting people that I've had the pleasure of meeting in this in this role so far. Just because like for anybody who hasn't read it yet, like our Sunday story is usually longer form journalism on some kind of obscure story that you maybe haven't heard of before. So he finds things like, you know, people who um, win lotteries multiple times or like um, he'll do a deep dive on different scam tactics or like there's just all kinds of interesting stuff. Broke this story last year during the pandemic of this guy up in Alaska who was basically feeding his entire town because it was so hard to get supplies in. He was kind of coordinating supplies and so he's a really interesting dude, finds really interesting stories. And uh, we were talking recently and he basically said, yeah, I don't even carry, he doesn't carry a cell phone when he goes out of the house, he carries a notebook. And like that's specifically to uh, just kind of foster that curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I admire it in anybody who's dedicated to that, like art of curiosity. Cause I think that, I mean, I think that's really what great storytelling comes down to. Um, that, and then the, the difficult parts that you mentioned, which were like writing true and then turning true writing into true writing. That sounds good. And those are, that's a lifelong art. I don't even know how to, Yeah, like, I couldn't, I couldn't begin to give advice on either of those, but, but that's what everyone's shooting for, you know? For sure. And you mentioned the hustle. Um, I want to get a little bit more into like a deep dive of the art of newsletters. Um, obviously, email addresses and newsletters is blown up the last two years, probably in large part because of the brand that you guys have created there. Um, so we're going to go there next. But I, I got to touch on this idea before we do. You mentioned storytelling. And you mentioned how it's like, part of being a human. And I've been really fascinated with this concept as well, because I would go one further. I think storytelling is almost like in our DNA because, because we observe the world in stories. Like if you hear the bushes rustling or whatever the word for it, like, what do you think? You think, oh my God, is that a lion? Is there something out to get me? So like instantly there's characters instantly there's a drama, you know, there's a villain, there's a thing to be fearful of. I read this study. Actually, I didn't read it. It was a YouTube video. Um, I'll have to find it. I'll link it in the show notes. It'll be difficult to explain. So if you're listening to this, use your imagination, but there's just a square and there's three shapes. There's two triangles and another square inside the bigger square. Suddenly a little door opens in the square and then the two triangles and the smaller square are kind of dancing around it, right? And the person who did this, the story asked people what was happening. And they're like, oh, it's obvious. There's a big bully who's trying to pick on a girl and the little square is trying to stick up for her. And then the psychologist was like, no, it's just shapes on a page. <laughs> but like, <laughs> as human beings, we can't help but observe the world in stories. Um, so so I, I guess just speak on that for a little bit. I'm interested to hear your take. Uh, yeah, well, that, that sounds fascinating. And it's funny, even as you were saying it, like, as soon as you mentioned, there were two different types of shapes in there, my mind went to something similar, which is like, a, um, I, I'm not sure if I was visualizing it properly, but sort of like an odd man out scenario where yeah. there where was, you know, two of one kind and one of another, which is so interesting. I've never heard it put that way. But you're right, I think our brains are uniquely wired for story. And Personally, I think, um, yeah, my personal opinion is that storytelling is quite a bit wider uh, than most people would uh, admit or classify. So, like, obviously, writing is storytelling and, mm -hmm. you know, videography is storytelling and photography is storytelling. But I think things like music are even a form of storytelling. In fact, mm -hmm. I mean, I see another thing we have in common is that we both have whiteboards in our office. I'm a big whiteboard fan. And I used to have sort of these few principles on that whiteboard 
which were like the few things that I really want to focus on for my career because, you know, being in tech, there's a lot you can pay attention to being a writer. It's like, you can pretty much do whatever you want. So the hardest thing is really figuring out what to say yes to and what to say no to. Yeah. And one of the key things that like, I really want to focus on is that, you know, things like health, growing wealth, personal relationships, but then storytelling is right up there with them. And I use storytelling in its broadest sense, which is like, okay, well, if I'm going to learn piano as an example right now, um, how does that tie in with one of these? And I think it's a, I think it's a form of storytelling. You know, you hear music and it evokes some kind of emotion and that's on purpose. People who are able to do that are doing it on purpose. So I, I, I love what you said that it's core to our DNA and, and perhaps even what makes us unique. You know, I don't think our intelligence is what makes us unique. In fact, I think you could debate whether or not we're very intelligent at all, but <laughs> our ability to tell stories is certainly seems to be inherent in us. So, yeah, I, I agree, man. That's the thing for sure. Um, <laughs> all right, cool. Let's dive into a little bit of technical stuff. Um, sure. Again, I was doing some research, but man, you, you put this thing together for me by publishing the newsletter engine. Uh, for anybody who's interested, go to Ethan's Twitter. Again, I'll link it on the show notes of the podcast at timstots.com. Uh, I put this on my newsletter this morning. Uh, man, oh, thanks, like man. it is great for real. And I'm not just saying that because you're on my podcast and I'm trying to like fucking fluff you up or anything. It, <laughs> it like broke it down into stages. Um, uh, okay, so let me just explain this a little bit. And then hopefully, if you're willing, we can go through it in some detail. There are three levels to the newsletter engine, starting from the foundation and building upward. The levels are product, what you make, monetization, how it makes money, growth, and how you get new readers. So my question is, which one of those levels do you start at? If you're trying to create a newsletter, where it's almost like you need all three of them. Like what's the point of having a newsletter if you're not growing it and nobody's reading it, right? What's the point in spending hours and hours on this content if you're not getting anything out of it? And in this case, we have monetization, but there could be other forms of monetization. Let's just call it, you know, reward or currency or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then what it is that you're creating. So you got product monetization and growth. If I'm somebody who's looking to get started, like where the fuck do I even start? Great question. Actually, that's one nobody's asked yet, but it, it's a great question. And the short answer is product, mm. specifically the content. Um, so product, the, the product category is basically what goes into the newsletter itself, what makes you unique as a newsletter. And this is things like this, there's three categories, content, uh, technology, so the yep. technology that runs your product, and then community. All three of those things are foundational to how your business works as a newsletter or how your newsletter works, even if it's not monetized. And, and this is crucial. You can never monetize or grow your way out of a product problem. Mm. If you have uh, a newsletter that's just not very good, you can throw a lot of money at paid growth and you can use the most creative business models to monetize, it's probably not going to work for long. Yeah. And this is something um, every person that I interviewed doubled down on this too. So I spoke with like Tyler Denk, who was employee number two at the Morning Brew and uh, helped really help build their growth programs from scratch. And he said the exact same thing. You know, he says, you know, everybody wants to know growth. Everybody wants to know how to make money. The reality is you have to write a kick-ass newsletter first. This, everything else hinges on that. So the short answer is product. If you're picking one place to start, focus on product. Um, to go a little bit deeper, thank, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Like this is a model that we developed over the course of about six months, just interviewing people, talked to a whole bunch of businesses and learned how their companies work and then really who, who tried to- involved in this just so I can give some shout outs? Uh, so, uh, a bunch of people here, like, like the uh, whole Brad team. Wolverton. Yeah. Brad Wolverton who's our head of content Colby, uh, who like was really one of my uh, closest sort of, 
collaborators on this. And then in terms of the way it looks, uh, you know, like we distilled this model, but uh, our designer Mallory is the one who made it look awesome. So, so there's a lot of people involved in, uh, in, in bringing this to you. Um, but it was really important that we figured it out because um, I knew as we were, we were writing this huge research report, it was uh, hundreds of pages long. We're, oh. I, I knew that we needed something to anchor it, right? Like, how do you talk somebody through hundreds of pages of content? And uh, so you know, we started really looking for a visual model that explained the business as a whole. And this is what's key about the newsletter engine for people to understand is that it represents, if you look at the model in full, the full potential of a newsletter business. So there is the product layer. Above that, there's monetization and there's three different types of monetization. There's basically three ways you can make money from a newsletter. You have free subscriptions, uh, low priced subscriptions and high priced subscriptions. Now, some businesses have all three of those. Some have just one, some have two. There's a lot of different combinations. And on their own, any one of those can be $100 million newsletters. So it's important to know that the entire engine represents sort of the full capacity or the full potential, mm -hmm. but uh, you don't necessarily need to have it all in order to run a successful business. But you do need product. You, you got to have product in order for any of this to work. Excellent. So let's assume whoever is reading this is a great writer, the building a great brand and a reputation. People are signing up and not just signing up, but sharing. So we got the product stage covered. Um, you touched on monetization. And I think when people hear that, they think, oh, sure, you monetize through ads or you monetize through subscriptions. Uh, however, you just touched on it in, in your, your previous statement, but I want to dive into each, all three of these. So we got free newsletter, low price newsletter, high price newsletter. Like what are some examples of these three tiers? And um, you don't have to get too into it, but like what are some of the pros and cons of both, of all three? Yeah, sure. So great question. And I'll get, yeah, I'll pause for a brief shout out to um, people like James Altucher and Ryan Dice, who really were instrumental in helping us figure this out too. Cool. Um, he's one of my like dream podcast guests is James Altucher. Really? Yeah. Sometimes that, a, he says shit and I'm just like cringing, but then other times he says shit and it's so prophetic. And I'm like, man, he's just, I just respect people who are willing to be themselves regardless of like what other people think about it. Yeah. He, he's a really interesting guy. And, um, I, I mean, hair. just having, he's got great hair. Yeah. Controversial guy too. And I, I also respect his ability to be himself in, in the face of that. And just having spoken with him pretty extensively, like I get the sense that he genuinely, like he cares what people think, but he's also still willing to just say what he feels is true. And you don't have to agree with everybody, but mm -hmm. somebody's willingness to speak their mind, I, I've, I've always respected it. So um, he was instrumental in helping us really figure this out. Uh, I'll run through it from beginning to end. So as I mentioned, there's three ways you can make money from a newsletter. You have free subscriptions, which are monetized via ads and affiliate deals, kind of two sides of the same coin. Then you have low price subscriptions and high price subscriptions. Low price subscriptions are often called front end products and high priced are called back end products. And so the way that the model works is you have your free newsletter, which has the biggest audience because there's the lowest barrier to entry. And then your free newsletter becomes distribution for your paid newsletter. You use it to market the front end product and then the front end markets the back end product. Um, so they work together to kind of draw people deeper and deeper into your ecosystem. And as that happens, you are doing a couple of things. If you choose to build all three, which again is a choice, but if you choose to build all three, you have diversified your revenue, mm -hmm. which can protect you from different like changes in the market. Uh, and you've grown the lifetime value of the customers, the readers who have continued on to the paid subscription. Sure. Um, and you know, like as, so examples of this, um, I'll give you a few. So if you look at the morning brew more, the uh, last time I checked and they're launching newsletters left and right. So this might've even changed by now, but the last time I checked, they were running seven free newsletters and yeah. doing about $30 million. I think they were on track for 30 million this year. Um, so that's one example. Like 
You don't need all of them. I do know that they're considering some paid content uh, options for probably the reasons we're going to talk about, which is diversifying revenue and growing CLTV. Um, but very successful company, all free newsletters. Then you have somebody like The Hustle, right? We have a free newsletter and we have one paid newsletter, which is Trends. Um, now, Trends, the way it's priced, would typically land it actually somewhere between front and back end. But really, for anybody who knows this, it's a front end product. It's yeah. pretty general and it's not super expensive. The key difference, I, maybe I should just touch on this a little bit here. The key difference, by the way, between those front and back end products, front end is typically a little more general and typically starts around five to 10 bucks a month or 100 bucks a year. That's a generalization, but that's about where they're typically priced. And you can think about Substack subscriptions as a yeah. version of that. Back end products, typically much more specific and often start around $500 and go all the way up. And you can have back end products that are in the tens of thousands of dollars. James Altucher is a great example of this. So he has a free newsletter. He has, um, I think it's somewhere between two and four front end newsletters. And they're all kind of based around different aspects of life, business building, investing. And then he has, again, somewhere between two and four back end newsletters. And those are anywhere from a thousand to 5,000 plus. And they focus on like very specific investing strategies. Yeah. Almost like market so. reports. Yeah. And, and so if you understand how the model works, there's a couple of really cool things you can do with it. For example, you can use it to uh, break down your business and figure out where some white space might exist. Right. So like if you already have a free newsletter and you know, okay, well, you know, maybe the next step would be, this front end product, what can we do for a front end product that can diversify our revenue and grow our CLTV of readers? Um, you can also use it to break down other companies and sort of analyze how they're doing business. So again, you know, you look at somebody like James Altucher, he's operating on all three of these monetization strategies and you, you know what to look for if you have the model and, and, and kind of dissect how his business works. This is so fascinating to me because I like looking at things through workflows, let's call them, where you could look at anything and just be like, okay, that's a business, there's your distribution, there's your product. But when you actually break it down, the nuances clearly separate the different frameworks, right? And I think about my own, um, I think about my own company. With Copyblogger, we, we have 120,000 subscribers. We gain about anywhere from 110 to 130 new subs a day. And that's significant. It's really growing. But the free newsletter that we send out every Friday, um, it's got a really, really good open rate. And I can't figure out how to make what we would call the free newsletter. I cannot figure out how to make that thing monetize. Um, and with that being said, it doesn't always need to, like you're saying, like, I don't need to leverage everything and put ads on it. Because as of right now, the free newsletter is basically a distribution channel for our paid newsletter. I would, I would consider ours more of like a membership site, but being part of the membership comes with a weekly newsletter, which is like higher end, a little bit more well-researched content and masterclasses and education, whatever. So, mm -hmm. so when you, you break it down in this newsletter engine, you can actually see where you would apply different strategies or different tactics to um, each compartment, let's call them. So, so I guess what I'm saying is like, I'm basically just reiterating what you're saying. You don't necessarily have to do all three, all of them present their own unique abilities and challenges. But now that you can see the difference, it makes it easier to see strengths and weaknesses, like in your own email marketing slash newsletter slash product line. For sure. Yeah. And, um, the, the goal was to sort of get down to the essence of what each of those areas of a business is really trying to do. I mean, to your point, yeah. you don't necessarily, even if you have a large free newsletter, you don't have to monetize it. Um, one of my favorite newsletter writers, Cody Sanchez, she writes um, Contrarian Thinking, which is this really great look at, you know, investing and business building. And 
uh, she also is a partner, or uh, she may be chair at this point, I'm not sure, but basically as deep in the VC space, she runs a, an investment fund. And her free newsletter has stayed free, there's no ads in it, but just by talking through her thinking, she has attracted millions of dollars into her investment fund, which yep. Yep. is a form of monetization. So. Uh, there are advantages to just running an ad free newsletter as well. It, and when you understand, you know, how the business breaks down, you can make those decisions better for yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, really cool. So, all right, we got one more and I think this is so underappreciated, which is the tech stack that you're using. Um, mm. I'm not going to get too, opinionated on this well maybe i will i think people that build newsletters on Substack are, are nuts um <laughs> like i just there's so many examples of this turning out not well um however when people say like i don't know how to build websites i don't know how to get started what should i do i tell them just to get started and the easiest place to do that is probably on Substack. all of that aside there's a lot of different ways to create a it's not quite, quite a tech stack, but just for semantic purposes, we'll just call it that. Like there's a lot of different ways to set up the infrastructure to collect emails and to deliver content to your subscribers. So again, let's play it from the role of like, I'm just getting started. How would you set up your software? Like how would you set up your tech? What do you think is the best place to, to get moving? Sure. Great question. And this is probably one of the most popular questions people want to know the answer to as well. Um, I'll say a couple of things. I think you're right. People tend to overthink this. Mm -hmm. If you're just getting started, the best option is to pick whatever is easiest and least expensive. And the two industry leaders for that right now are MailChimp. They've got the most market share. And Substack is by far one of the easiest. Um, there are other versions of Substack, like Twitter just bought Review recently, which kind of does a similar thing. Yep. But let me tell you this. So in, in talking to the technical leads at, at The Hustle and Morning Brew and other newsletters, we found something that was pretty interesting. Uh, we found that your tech stack, if you're building a successful newsletter business, your tech stack is going to change oh, yeah. a couple of times. And what we found is that uh, they tended to change around the same point for mostly the same reasons. So the way to think about it, and this is again, kind of a generalization, anybody who's technical can battle me on this. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to approach this, but if you're just looking for like a super concrete answer, here's how you can think about it. How many emails are you sending per day? If you're sending less than 100,000 emails per day, your tech stack is not going to matter. So pick whatever is easiest and cheapest and just get started and focus on writing a kick-ass newsletter. Now, what happens at 100,000 emails per day? That's when things like deliverability will actually, actually, let me pause for a second. A few things tend to happen in a newsletter company around this time. So anywhere from 70 to 100,000 free subscribers, your list is really big enough to monetize via ads. Mm -hmm. You could do it earlier if you wanted to, but at that point, like you can, you can do it and you can really make it worth your time. So people tend to start monetizing, which means they now have resources to think about hiring and think about their tech stack. Very often, this was the case at Morning Brew, this was the case at The Hustle. Once you hit about 100,000 subscribers, you are going to be working with somebody on the technical side, whether that's full-time or just a contractor that comes in. Some of the technical decisions become a little more nuanced. And so very often newsletters are work, they have somebody to handle some of the technical stuff at that point. Yeah. So with both of those in mind, you've monetized, you've got somebody who's technical. Once you hit that 100,000 subscriber mark, that's when something, uh, that's when deliverability will start to make a serious difference in your revenue. So below that, mm. you really just got to focus on um, writing a great newsletter. But once you're at 100,000, if you have, you know, like uh, even a small percentage of those people bouncing or you're newsletters being classified as spam by their inbox, like that can be several thousand people a day, which starts to have a significant impact on your bottom line. 
So at that point, around 100,000 subscribers, people tend to notice that there's like now a, a financial reason to reconsider their tech stack. And that's when they upgrade. That's the first upgrade. The second one is around a million users. So you can ride it from like zero to 10,000, just use whatever's easy, or sorry, zero to 100,000, whatever's easiest and least expensive. 100,000 to about a million, that's usually the same tech stack. And then from a million plus, I mean, you're running a pretty substantial media business and, you, and you're gonna have a more complex tech stack at that point. Um, that's a lot to absorb, but if, 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 if that was clear, I'll, I'll take one step deeper for anybody who's thinking about this or might be a little bit more Yeah, please do, it was advanced. perfectly clear. Cool, okay, so um, when, it, <clears throat> when it comes to your tech stack, there are basically five key areas that a newsletter business needs to think about. Now, if you're not running a newsletter business, yeah. this is a different story. Mm -hmm. But for a business, there's five. It's your website, um, your registration software, your payment provider, your ESP, you know, what you use to send the email, and then the analytics software that you use. So those five are present in any, well, in most newsletter businesses, so early on, you're looking for kind of like an all-in-one solution that can handle those. And that's why TechStack and MailChimp and even to some extent HubSpot, but HubSpot's like a little bit more advanced. And I, I think actually is better reserved for somebody once they've really found their footing as an yeah. email marketer. But early on, you're looking for something that can give you like all five of those at once. And then as you grow, you will start to like plug and play each one individually. You'll want better analytics tools for different areas of your newsletter, whether it's your website or what's going on in the inbox or what's going on with your advertising or whatever. Um, you may switch your payment provider in order to make like, like you know, a Substack cent charges. Per transaction. <laughs> yeah. Or in the case of if you start on Substack, you know, they've got a, a sizable fee for running your paid newsletter. Once you go past a certain point, you, most people want to switch. In fact, I think even Substack wants you to switch because they're, sort of building for a certain size creator. So anyways, um, as you grow, you will start to plug and play with those. But generally speaking, five key areas, website, uh, registration software, payment provider, ESP and analytics. And as you, as you build, you will want to think about each of those. So I would imagine there's some people listening to this thinking to themselves, this doesn't apply to me that much because I'm just, just a, I don't know, a guy or a gal trying to get a couple of subscribers. And I want to stay on this for a little bit because it matters and it matters a lot faster than you think it's going to. So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we built our second tier, our back end product on MemberPress, which is probably in my opinion, one of the best ways to do it just because I'm a fan of how WordPress builds just about everything like that. However, um, we found that the community aspect on MemberPress was lacking because MemberPress basically can build forums, but MemberPress doesn't allow you to have that kind of 2.0 social media scroll type thing. So we needed to put a community into it as well, alongside having um, a way to distribute the newsletter. And we thought about it a lot. We looked at Circle. We looked at Mighty Networks. Ultimately, we chose to put the community itself in Mighty Networks simply because we have a lot of educational products too. And Mighty allows you to upload um, natively onto their platform. There's pros and cons to all of them, not necessarily advocating for any of them. However, and this is where it gets crazy. This is the shit that you don't think of until all of a sudden it's here and you think, wow, this is a really big problem. Um, Mighty doesn't have the ability to create and customize landing pages. And they have a landing page that's built natively into it and it looks good. However, when you get really sophisticated, you can't put deadline funnels on it, you know? So like once you got a hundred people every day, you want to put them through a deadline that says like, Hey, if you sign up for the next seven days, you get a hundred dollars off. And that landing page, once the deadline funnel is done, once those seven days are over, that landing page needs to go to the original price point because you can't just have it floating out there because then you're not um, honoring your deal to the people who did, excuse me, take advantage of that. So anyway, 
it's a problem, you know, and you got to figure out how yeah. to solve this stuff. And so ultimately what we did is we kept the landing pages on member press, static on WordPress, kept deadline funnels moving and built a really custom Zapier route so that if they get tagged as a person who purchases the membership, then they get sent an invite from Mighty Networks into the secret membership, basically. So like, you know, <laughs> it's not a problem until all of a sudden it is. And if you don't take advantage of this stuff, especially I find with tech, um, it's always one of those things where like, if you knew what you needed to know before the problem came up, you would have done a different solution, but you're always reacting because it's very, very difficult to foresee these things coming. Um, so like, that's just one example, right? And we could talk about a hundred different ways on how these little nuances come together, but it, it's really, really important. And I hope, I hope that people appreciate what you put together in the newsletter engine with some of the tech stuff, because I, uh, the, the best way to say it is you don't realize it's a problem until it's a problem. And then it's like a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be like a great chapter subheading for that. Cause that's, I feel like that's my entire career in tech summed up in one sentence. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, yeah, you're, God. I was just gonna say, you're totally right about that. And like some of these things are easier to switch out than others too. Like it's easier to test a new analytics platform than it is to test a new website platform. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to test a new website sometimes than it is to test a new ESP. And so the, like, the reason I encourage people to hold off on a lot of these decisions until their business is quite mm -hmm. a bit larger is because, yeah, you just need resources to be able to dedicate to this. And if you're not bringing in money, keep it simple. You yeah. know, just, just use whatever's easiest. I totally agree. All right. Um... You've given me so much of your time, man. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll finish up on uh, one more concept, which I think you're going to have a really specific point of view on. Everybody wants to have a newsletter now. It seems almost, there's just always new trends where people say this is where you have to be. And with the technology, some things like Substack, it's, it's easier than ever to create a newsletter. And I wonder, is this just a, tr I've always advocated newsletters for the same reason that you have, right? It's the only medium in which you have a direct relationship with your audience and the price, the revenue per email subscriber with email is, I don't even know, probably 10 times more than like any other platform. Um, the cost per impression through an email newsletter is usually like $45, right? If you're putting Google AdSense on a website, it's like a cent. So like <laughs> emails are important and you can make a ton of money from them. Do you think that the demand for newsletters is going to shrink over the next five years simply because everybody is trying to grab their piece of the pie? That's a great question. Personally, there is personally, I think there is definitely an aspect of this that is a hype cycle, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, part of that is okay. It's not that, like, I think one of the reasons there's a hype cycle around this is because a lot of these tools are making this business viable for the first time in this way. Like, if you look at the cost of running a newspaper, right? Like a local newspaper. That used to be a profitable business. And then technology changed and introduced a whole bunch of competition that basically made that business model obsolete. And now all of a sudden, like new upstarts have the opportunity to build just as big of a company with far fewer resources. I think the same thing will probably happen to newsletters at some point. Like, we're all sort of competing for the same attention and more and more people are going to come into the space. So there is an aspect of this that is hyped, but I will say this as with all forms of media, the people who are really good at it, yeah. the ones who really care, I don't think there's any expiration date on building one. Like I, I think the hype will die down, but I don't think the opportunity will disappear for somebody who does it right. And 
you know, Sam's uh, got some interesting opinions on this. He said recently, like, you know, everyone's in newsletters right now. Um, you should go start a blog, right? Like nobody's blogging anymore. Everyone's doing newsletters and he's right. In some ways, the key to standing out in media is doing what nobody else is doing. And that's why newsletters are so popular right now. Um, but I think my opinion is that both of those things can be true at the same time. A blog can be like the next major opportunity. That doesn't mean that it, uh, newsletters will immediately fail. Bad newsletters will fail. Uh, but our goal with this was really to be able to lay out the business model in a way that teaches people how to build something sustainable mm. and like understand what they're doing. And by the way, the last thing I'll say on this, it's kind of funny when you talk to people in the industry who've been doing this for a long time, they're a little um, incredulous of the newsletter buzz because they're like, look, this is just a media business. It's the same as it's always been. Like you're just in media, you know? It's a new delivery mechanism, sure, but that concept of like free products monetized via ads, low cost subscription, high cost subscription, it's age old and it will always work. So whether it's a blog or, you know, like Twitter with their new paid tweets or whatever, the medium will change, but the business model I think is going to outlast the hype. I totally agree. And I think what will happen is it just gets more and more long tail because now everybody can create a brand around whatever, right? Like, I don't even know. I'm really into graphic novels. You know, I've been into them since I was a kid. There's not that many people that are into them, but there's ridiculously, uh, what, what the fuck's the word I'm looking for? Like loyal people that are also passionate about graphic novels online. You can create a huge subscription newsletter business through just graphic novels. I mean, I don't know, whatever, name yeah. it, like carpentry or like art or who knows, any as subbed down a niche as you can get. So what I'm saying is I think, I think content will continuously get subbed and subbed and subbed and subbed to the point mm -hmm. where there can be well-established brands for anything. It's just going to be so long tail and there's going to be the top of the arc, right? The 20 percenters that have 80% of the business that, you know, the hustles, the Bloombergs, right? Um, those people are just always going to dominate. But like, frankly, that's okay because I actually think for regular folks who may want to live this kind of lifestyle where you have like freedom and creative expression and do whatever you want, I think the opportunity for this is really in those long tails. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you don't need a huge audience yeah. to build a viable business if you know how to monetize well. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the long tail. I just saw this guy on TikTok the other day. He talks like he talks about parking barricades, like and traffic barricades. That's his thing. He's and he's like an architect and he designs these, so his pieces are really interesting. But he's got like 400,000 followers on, on TikTok. It's amazing. So do your thing. Like yeah. I, I think, and by the way, I think this actually really brings us full circle to your first question, which is where do you start? You start with product and specifically like that content strategy. Mm -hmm. Make something great. Make something that you love. And the reason is if you do that, your audience will follow you across the mediums, right? Like Hustle started as a conference. We weren't a newsletter company. And who knows what will be five years from now, yeah. right? But if you zero in on that thing that you really like, your people, like the stories that you tell, it doesn't matter what medium you choose. They will continue to follow you. Agreed totally. And, and one last point on this. I made kind of a patronizing tweet yesterday, basically saying that like I would – if I was a teenager, I would make so much money cutting lawns because nobody yeah. wants to do it. They all want to be YouTubers. And what the fuck do you know happens? Some guy retweets it. And he's like, this really means a lot to me because I do work, but I have a YouTube channel about cutting my own lawn. <laughs> and that's his entire <laughs> YouTube channel. It's just him <laughs> trying to make his lawn as good as possible. And his, his videos have thousands and thousands of views. And I was just thinking to myself like, wow, you could easily make a newsletter about your lawn. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's awesome, man. Oh, yeah, that, it is. Yeah, that's it's cool. The thing. 
there's so much opportunity out there. I think, I, um, you know, people just, just need to build yeah. you know, like what they love. Yeah, yeah. And then somebody asked me the other day too, they said like, what's more important? Um, it was like writing a great newsletter or knowing how to monetize it. And I gave him, uh, mm. I cheated. I said, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat and give you two answers. The first answer is writing a great newsletter. If you know how to write a great newsletter, like that's the most important thing, right? Cause it's going to fail without that. But if you know how to monetize, um, you can build a really successful business on an okay newsletter. You don't have to be Hemingway. Right. You just have to be like in tune with what it is you believe. Yeah. So, and I think that's what people are doing over at Copy Blogger. Thanks, man. We're working hard. It's been a hell of an adventure. Sometimes I still wake up in the morning and I'm like, wait, <laughs> did I really do this? Um, and it's been a lot of work, but I'm really proud of it. Thank you for the compliment. That actually means a lot to me. It's, it's, you know how it is. You're behind the scenes and you wonder if anybody's even paying attention, right? No matter how big your audience is, you're still just you inside your own fickle little mind. Um, <laughs> and so that means a lot to me. We've been working hard. So thank you. Sure thing, man. All right. So Ethan, thank you so much for your time. We went overboard, but I was just enjoying this conversation so much. We're just rolling with it. So we got... Uh, the hustle.co. Uh, we got trends.co. You can follow you on Twitter at what is it? Damn Ethan, damn underscore Ethan. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, damn Look for the gray background. <laughs> yeah, with the gray <laughs> background. Um, do you got a personal website? Uh, I don't. I don't right now. Actually, do I? <laughs> no, I think. Um, do, do I? <laughs> Best place to find me is either on Twitter or if you're interested in some of this stuff, like the monetization, we are going to be releasing a lot more of it via trends. So anybody Love who's that. in that community is getting it all. So Love it, check us out. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ethan. Next time, uh, well, not next time. We will be in Austin shortly, my wife and I. So we'll, we'll meet up and get some coffee. I'm looking forward to it. All right. It's a plan, man. We'll all see right, you. Brother.